Hello again from Concordia Theological Seminary for lectionary podcast, time to play around with a gospel reading yet again. Uh, this is a tricky text that we're looking at this coming Sunday. Uh, for those of you keeping score at home, the reading is Matthew 22, verses 15, uh, 15 through 22. And what makes this text hard, frankly, is it's almost too cliched. We all kind of know where this is going to go. Oh, do you pay taxes to Caesar or not? And it gives you all kinds of preaching opportunities. So, for example, if you'd like a chance to talk uh, to kingdom theology, this is one of those basic key texts that lends itself in all kinds of directions. Yeah, render to Caesar what is Caesar, render to God what is God, is almost cliched, if you will. And it does function pretty well that way. So what I'd like us to contemplate in these moments together as we think about a text that we all kind of know is where's the tension and where else can we go? The text itself is, like most of Matthew, relatively straightforward. But the words are also, also raise key issues. The first thing is this issue of testing that goes on. Once you enter Matthew 22, you now are in test after test of Jesus. Stay tuned for the Sunday after this and you'll hear one more test and a counter test by Jesus as well. That we now have reached a point in which Matthew's, as Matthew's gospel is making a climax. The Pharisees have had their chance. And here we get a most unholy alliance. A note verse 15, then the Pharisees went and they plotted to entangle. Okay, this is bad enough. Time out. The Pharisees, after all, in Matthew's gospel, are the equivalent of a spaghetti western version of a cowboy wearing a black hat. We know these are the quote-unquote bad guys. But what makes things particularly ugly here is this weird unholy alliance that develops. Because if you take a look at the next verse, now we have a problem. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Step back a half step and we see the problem. The Pharisees and the Herodians are not traditional allies. They truly are in that land of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And to see both the Pharisaic party and the Herodian sympathizer party in alliance really does ratchet the tension of the text. Now we know we're in trouble. This is the last hurrah for the Pharisees to have their chance and ultimately to have no other alternative but to crucify Jesus. So on one hand, we see this nasty, difficult, and frightening alliance that is made. The terms for Jesus aren't all that exciting. Typically, they call him teacher, which seems okay, as we see in verse 16. The daskala is the word that's being used there, which at one hand doesn't seem all that noteworthy, except for the fact that the only people who use didaskala are the Pharisees and the teachers. And they set up a devious question. The question itself, we know the alternatives. Commit treason and have Rome against you, or commit blasphemy and turn the people. This is not a nice thing they're doing. And Jesus calls them out on it. The question itself is pretty basic, but note what happens in verse 18. Start out with a good old-fashioned participle for those of you keeping score at home. Now Jesus, because he knew the evil, he said, taking that predicate position participle perhaps as causative, genus, why do you pyrazeta, why do you test me? Now we have a problem. Pyrazeta sends us all the way back to Satan, the devil, and the temptation of Jesus. The verb that Jesus is saying the Pharisees use is the exact verb that Satan uses while tempting Jesus. Pyrazeta, hypocrites. Jesus exposes their agenda as people that ultimately are not on his side, but are tools of Satan. 
And then he gets into the classic way of getting out of the problem, taking a look at the coin. So now we've reached our climax and we begin to wonder, and what's great about all of these tests, so stay tuned to the following week as well, is that every one of these, Jesus takes a seemingly eh, tricky question and blows it up in their face. They want to catch him. Jesus instead defines the kingdom of God. Give to Caesar unto Caesar, what is God is what is God's, epodidomi, pretty classic word being used there in verse 21, well, typical word. But the issue now becomes, what does the kingdom of God look like? It's very difficult, I dare say impossible, that whenever we're dealing with the Gospels that we not refer to kingdom of God, the reign of God, uh, God's inbreaking promises in Christ, defeating Satan, and what does it look like? On one hand, Jesus says, with the kingdom of God, you can still, you can still render oh, payment to Caesar without rendering political loyalty and avoids the problem of the text. But even more so to continue is the economy that Jesus introduces. That yes, Caesar has his place, but more importantly, render to God what is God's. This gives us the entry into the two kingdom theology, should you want to go that direction. But moreover, it shows us that in the economy of the kingdom of God, the economy that we as baptized people participate in, that things are done markedly different that things are done wonderfully different. Their allegiance to Jesus, our faith, our allegiance, our trust, results in a different sort of way of regarding people. And this connects us all the way back to the Old Testament, in which how are God's people characterized by mishpat and zedekah, justice and righteousness. It connects us to that different sort of economy, a way of regarding the poor and the vulnerable as important. Moreover, the, the divine economy, the kingdom of God, the rendering to God what is God's, puts the Pharisees and the Herodians in an awkward spot. He answers their question, and kai akusantas thalmasan, and after they heard it, they thalmazod, if you will, they marveled. Marveling here, not faith marveling here, being dumbfounded and amazed. They no longer can trap him on a question. He's redefined the terms. And they leave him alone. Game, set, match. One test down, another one to go, followed by another. Stay tuned. Everybody gets their chance during this final chapter here. This, not final, there's more to that than, that, than Matthew. During these during this chapter of Matthew. The Sadducees will get their commitments. Pharisees will show up one last time. This is now building us to a great proclamation for the following Sunday, where Jesus declares himself as the son of David. So welcome to a familiar text. It's familiar and not. It raises questions over the nature of the Pharisees, and how by opposing and attempting to test Jesus, they're playing the role of Satan. It shows us that the reign of God is, again, radically different. It's, beyond, it's with different priorities. And it also begins this building to the eventual stopping of Jesus' opponents. Game, set, match, Pharisees, Herodians, Sadducees, and Pharisees one last time in which Jesus now brings things to their ultimate climax, by which nothing is left but for him to be killed, for him to die, and bring about God's inbreaking of the kingdom in a much more radical, wonderful way through his death, resurrection, and ascension. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. We all kind of know this text. But play around with the tension. Play around with the tension of what it means to have this testing going on and how those who, uh, who oppose God are revealed as Satan, as, you know, and as Satan's instruments. And again, to play around with this wonderful contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. And once again, enjoy these texts. Enjoy the, and I pray that you enjoy them. 
as you preach this message to God's people this coming Sunday, God's blessing on your preaching task, God's blessings on your ministries, once again from scenic Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana.